Hey, it is so good to be with you here in Brisbane. Uh, it, uh, I was speaking to my girls on the way in before the 8.30 service this morning, and what is it, 23, 24 degrees outside? Something like that. As, uh, as they were leaving for the 8.30 service this morning, my daughter said the temperature was, feels like a stonking 1.8 degrees. So it is great to be here in Brisbane. We've got a few of our other uh, Tasmanian friends that are up here. Guys, uh, yeah, anyway, maybe we'll just stay here. <laughs> but uh, for those who I haven't met, I, uh, Morella and I have two daughters, and all their lives they have done as daughters do. They have challenged us to be better parents. Yes. In fact, both of our girls thought it would be awesome to get married in the space of eight weeks of each other which is incredibly exciting and we love the guys that they have chosen to be their life partners, but it has meant that I've been busy selling off body parts for the last six months. <laughs> which is really annoying to be honest because we spent five years of our life in the Middle East and at age 13, Jaron, uh, Kira, our youngest, was walking with Morella and somebody physically, seriously offered um, three camels for, the, for my daughter's hand in marriage at 13. So I could have had six camels and instead I've sold off a kidney and a liver. Yes. But uh, as a family, we spent five years living in the Middle East and uh, in a country called Qatar. And I worked as a critical care paramedic, which is meant I get to do some really cool things, like drive really quickly across 80 metre sand dunes, which was fun. And this is a true story. I think we've got a photo. My main work vehicle was this. So that's kind of cool, right? But to be honest, it's not the best thing about the Middle East. The best thing was the people I got to meet. And um, I got to hang out with amazing men and women, including a guy that I think we had another photo, a guy called, there he is, Dr. Muhammad Fala. Dr. Muhammad Fala was the advisor to the Minister of Health in Qatar. And he and his family were Sunni Muslims. In fact, his father was the local imam, which is like the, the head of the mosque in the area, very high up. In, in the Muslim faith. And uh, I got to work with Dr. Fala uh, on a daily basis. And I had many conversations with him about my faith. And he would often say to me, he said, Sean, your faith? Because remember, their, their view of Jesus is very different in the Muslim world. I encourage you to, to read through these things so you have an understanding of what different faiths do. But he would say, Sean, your faith in a human who was killed on a cross for our sins, for your sins, is not what grabs me. But he said, what grabs me is the values of, of what you uphold in your faith life. And that makes him want to know more about what I believe. Yeah. Can I tell you, your faith life matters to others. Yes. Yes. This is a guy who had lived his life as a Sunni Muslim. His father is an imam. And yet he saw something in me over a couple of years, he never came to our church, I'm not allowed to evangelise to him, yet he saw something in me that was different. He saw the way I would respond and act to things that was different. Can I tell you, the way you respond and act things with your faith is right. going to change the world. Right. I really do believe that. So I, uh, I want to share a message with you that I've titled this morning, Here I Am. And it takes courage to say these words. Whether you're a young person in our youth, whether you've been on a faith journey for 40 years, it takes courage to say, hey God, here I am. But I am passionate that both individually and as a church, that we have been called to be the voice and the hands and feet of Jesus here on earth. Yes. And so I apologise if I get a little bit passionate today, but I'm unapologetic in saying that if we are committed to wanting to see the lives of our family, friends and our community transformed, then we need to stop running to man and start running to God and boldly declaring, speak God, because I am here and I am ready. Come on. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 20, verses 16 to 24. As you're doing that, a big hello to our online community that are out there. Acts chapter 20, verses 16 to 24. Um, now, this passage is, if those who know Acts, you're good theologians in the room here, it's getting towards the end of Paul's ministries. He's been on a number of different trips and he's, and he's on his way back to Jerusalem, to Pentecost, and he wants to stop and tell the leaders in Ephesus, because Ephesus was kind of his favourite church, although you're not supposed to have favourites, but he was kind of his favourite church, and he wants to tell the leaders of all the good things that God has been doing 
through his ministries. It's kind of like one of those ones, I'm going to start today, it's kind of like one of those ones where, you know when you watch a movie and they give you the ending first and then you go back and watch the rest of it? Morella hates them, right? But that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of tell you the life of what Paul did, do the ending and then some attitudes that he had that we can all learn from. So Acts chapter 20, verses 16. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the very first day, I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I've declared to both Jews and to Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Verse 23, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying the good news of God's grace. My first point is this. We need to have humility. Paul starts this and he says, I served the Lord with great humility. I served, served the Lord with great humility. I, uh, I, was, I was watching the news a couple of weeks back where a, a supermarket chain is trialling a service-free, they call it a service-free checkout, where basically you walk up with your, your trolley of groceries and there's no one there to help you. It all scans it and then you pay whatever it is, a service-free. Now, I understand why they're doing this. It saves on costs of having employees there. Yet in my generation, we've gone from a fully check service checkout to self-service, now to no service. Can I tell you that the Christian world, what we do in church is so countercultural to this. We serve and it comes at a cost. It comes at a financial cost. It comes at a time cost. Who, who was that beautiful couple? Where, where's that couple that were weeding? They were somewhere over here. Hoopers? Hoopers, where are they? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everything you gave to us. But it comes at a cost, right? It comes at a cost of time, of things. It comes at a cost to serve. Yet Paul is saying, I served with great humility. At our church, we regularly give out what's called the Matthew 20, 28 award, which says Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, came not to be served, but to serve others. I worked for a king for five years. He was an actual king, worked for five years. On any given trip that we would go away with, he had 316 people looking after him. From those who would be there with his food, to, to his health team, to whatever it might be, on any given trip, there would be 316 people looking after him, serving him. Can I tell you? He used to invite me at breakfast time to come and sit next to him at the table. Do you know why? Because he was lonely. Right. Wow. 316 people were serving him, yet he was lonely. One of the greatest gifts that we have as a church is to serve others. And why? Because it builds a relationship, right? right. When you serve in community, whether it's at the coffee station out here, whether it's in your, your outreach programs that you do as a church here, we're doing it because it builds a relationship with people. Right. We serve others because we want to build relationship. We want to see how they, we want to give something back to others. And I love what Paul says here. He says, I served with great humility. Paul was one of the most significant characters in the Bible. He wrote one third of the New Testament. It says, you all know the story of when Saul, Saul he, he was known as Saul originally, when Saul was converted, he's on the road to Damascus, he gets struck down, he's fasting for three days in a place called Damascus. The Lord comes and speaks to a guy called Ananias. And he says to him, I want you to go and pray over this guy called Paul. And Ananias goes, well, I don't want to do this, man. He's a bad dude. 
what it comes down to is the reason the Lord said this, because he said to him, I want you to pray over him because Paul is favoured in the eyes of God. He has found favour in the eyes of God. He could have sat back and gone, where are my minions to do things for me? Yet what he did is he served. He was the first one to go out there. He was the first leader to go out there and he served and he did it with humility. So he backed this up. Romans chapter 12, verse three said this, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Here we go. I'm gonna... I'm gonna Speak with a bit of a challenge today, people, so you'll still love me at the end of it, I promise. But can I tell you, humility is not the same as insecurity. Insecurity is when we say, I can't do this because I'm no good or I'm a nobody. And actually, in some ways, in some places, insecurity can be a form of inverted pride. And Paul was so big on putting pride in its right place. Humility is understanding what God has given you, the gift of what God has given you. Not everybody is going to preach on the stage here, but it's the humility is, is understanding what God has given you, the gifts and talents and having the faith to say, here I am, use me. C.S. Lewis said this, he said, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, rather thinking of yourself less. My second point is this, tears. The same verse that says this, I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears. I held it together pretty well in the 8.30. But we need to start crying. One of the most common effects of working in crisis management, as I did for 21 years, is that you risk developing what's called compassion fatigue in that you see and hear so much trauma and pain that you eventually become numb to the needs of people. A couple of weeks back, I cried as I watched the events that were unfolding in both Sudan and the Haiti. But I cried because I felt no emotion. I cried because it was although I didn't care. Now, I did care. I've worked in places like this. Yet news like this can can become so commonplace that we literally just wait for the next newsreel to come so that we don't have to see these things. We need to start crying again for our people. We need to start anguishing for our people. In Romans 9, Paul said this, He said, I have anguish in my heart for those who are lost. I have anguish in my heart for those who are lost. How often do we cry for those who are lost? I think sometimes the reason we stopped crying is because we've got compassion fatigue. We've got compassion fatigue for the lost. That we don't know what to do. You see, what we need to start understanding again is that the lost don't have eternal life. The lost, the Bible tells us that the lost are going to go to hell. And that in itself can be very defining, can kind of like smack you in the face, thinking to yourself, well, I don't want to hear those things. Yet yet the Bible is so clear on this. It says that those who are lost will not have the eternal life that we have. And so we need to start having that anguish. That's why Paul had an anguish for people. That's why he cried for people. Because he knew what the alternative was. He knew what the alternative was when people didn't know Jesus, when people didn't accept Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. That's why he said, I had anguish. I had tears in my eyes crying for the lost. In Luke 15, it says that Jesus came to the walls of Jerusalem. And what did he do? He cried. Not because he couldn't get in, he cried for the lost that were within. 
Some, in, 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 there's three stories of the lost son, the lost sheep and the lost coin. We all know the lost sheep story. We all know the lost son, the prodigal son story. There's one there, the lost coin, that is four verses. Four verses only. I preach on that one more often than any of the other two. Do you know why? Because the lost coin never left the house. The lost coin was lost, but never lost, left the house. Can I tell you, there is people in our community, people in our church group, people on our databases who are lost. And we need to stop looking at them as, oh, why haven't you been in church? And actually start crying with them and understand their circumstance and understand where they've been and understand what they're going through. We need to get to the walls of our church. We need to walk in the doors and weep for the lost. As a church body, we should mourn when the church or pastors are persecuted. I'm not saying that some of their actions are not unacceptable, but when the body of Christ is attacked, we should mourn. It is sad to me that so often the greatest civil war is found within the walls of the church. My third point is this. Resilience, thanks guys. Resilience. Paul went on to say, I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. He goes on to say, verse 20, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. These words may not be popular, but I'm convicted to say what I want to say, what I'm going to say because I felt God saying it to me. And I'm not degrading people's real life situations. And I've had to spend a lot of time over the last few weeks on my knees in forgiveness. But we are living in a time when it is too easy to give up. It is too easy to give up on our work when we have a bad day. It's too easy to give up on our friends because they don't meet our standards. It's too easy to give up on our relationships when things get a little out of balance. It's too easy to give up on the church when we don't like what is being preached. If anybody knew tough conditions, it was Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 is a dossier of the things that happened to him. Read through it. It's a riveting reading. But it talks about the fact that Paul was whipped. They used, to, they used to whip him 39 times. The reason being is because they say that 40 whips could actually physically kill a person. That's evil, right? Paul knew suffering. Paul knew what it was to endure in his ministry. And yet with humility in his words and tears in his eyes, he is imploring the church in Ephesus to not give up. In fact, he goes on to say, don't even hesitate. When God calls, we need to say, here I am, whether we feel ready or not. So often we don't say here I am because we're not, we don't feel we're ready. I once had to uh, counsel a couple who purposely chose to not step into a ministry that they had indicated they tr so truly desired to step into. And I remember sitting with them beautiful people and I remember sitting with this couple and I said what is it that's holding you back from stepping into this ministry and these were the words they said they said we're not prepared for the testing and challenges that comes with stepping up for Jesus beautiful people had a heart for the ministry they were going to step into. But the thought of the challenges was too much for them. There's a guy in the Old Testament, a guy by the name of Abram. Story goes, it's in, in the chapters of Genesis, if you want to read it. Story goes that one night the Lord calls to Abram and his first response is to say, here I am. Here I am. <laughs> Can 
kind of sit there and go, cool. What do you want me to do, Lord? He said, I want you to take your son, walk up a hill and sacrifice him. It's like, really? I thought I was just running the kids' ministry. Kind of like the same thing. Abraham did that. Because he had said, here I am to God. He took his son, he walked up the hill. Yet God's plan was never for him to sacrifice his son. In fact, Abram would become the foundation of who we are, our father, Father Abraham. Yet what God was looking for was a heart, was a faith to say, here I am. Abraham is known as the father of faith, the founder of faith. Christianity comes with testing. And if you're thinking, Pastor, you are the worst salesman in this world for this thing called Christianity, then let me tell you this, knowing Jesus and having your eternity secured is worth more than anything the world can and will offer you. I'd rather be a humble servant for Christ and have the adulation of the world. And my final point is this, obedience. Why don't you stand with me? There's a story found in the Old Testament of a young man called Samuel who spent his days serving the local temple priest, a guy called Eli. The Scriptures tell us that although he knew of God, he didn't yet know God for himself. The story continues that one night while he was sleeping, the Lord spoke to Samuel. Not knowing that it was God calling him, he ran to Eli and in a sign of obedience, he said, here I am. But Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So Samuel went and lay down. Again, the Lord called him Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. My son Eli said, I did not call you, go back and lie down. A third time the Lord called Samuel. Samuel got up, went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. Then Eli realised that the Lord was calling the boy. I would say that half of my pastoral conversations come from those who are trying to search out a calling on their life. I wanna say this to you. If you have accepted Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord and Saviour, you already have a calling on your life. And that is to go and take what Jesus Christ has done for you and tell others about it. It's very simple. It says, go into all the world and tell others of what I have done for you. So often we look and going, well, but what is my calling? What am I gonna be doing? And there'll be times when you do these things. There'll be times when when you may get an audible picture or a visual picture with these sort of things. But in the meantime, we are called to be obedient. That's what we're called to do. We are called to say, here I am. Here I am, God, use me. Here I am, use me. Samuel did not know God. He knew of God, but he did not know God for himself. Yet what I love about that story is he still had an obedience to say, here I am. Even when you don't know the full picture, he still said, here I am. Even he didn't know who was calling him, he still said, here I am. Our calling is not to be comfortable. Our calling is to be messengers of the good news. And here's the thing. I believe that when we go out with an attitude that says, here I am, that we are gonna see others saved. When we go out with a heart that, that, that wants a heart of servanthood, when we go out with tears in our eyes and anguish for those who are lost, a heart to say, here I am, then I believe God will honour that and we will start seeing people return. I believe this. I believe that when we do this, we're gonna start seeing prodigals return. We're gonna start seeing prodigals returning to the house. Simply by saying, here I am.